you've operated with unlimited power and no supervision. That's something the world can no longer tolerate. Marvel's Civil War event is one of its biggest and most groundbreaking. Written primarily by Mark Miller, its events were inspired by real life political tensions and reached out to almost every corner of Marvel 616 Earth. So today on Top 10 Nerd, we're going to attempt to explain Marvel's Civil War and why it helped change the face of comics going forward. So the events of Civil War can actually trace themselves back all the way to Uncanny X-Men number 181 in 1984, with the mutant Registration Act that required that humans born with mutant powers register with the government. Now, if mutants are required to register, it does beg the question why other superpowered beings don't need to do the same. And in 1990, the Superhuman Registration Act is proposed as an expansion of the Mutant Registration Act, requiring registration from humans who aren't born with the mutant X gene but still gain enhanced abilities and powers. Now, problems arise with this as Mr. Fantastic points out flaws in the definition of superpowered beings and the unintentional issues that could arise and the matter is dropped. Now back in 2006, Marvel started to create comics with the Road to Civil War overarching title. Comics such as Amazing Spider-Man number 529 to 531, where Tony Stark informs Peter Parker that Congress is once again considering the Superhuman Registration Act. This time the SRA would require registration from humans who only have powers due to use of advanced or exotic technology, which is still incredibly Objective and applies to more than just superheroes as Reed Richards, Tony Stark, Hank Pym and others have made standard issue tech for many agencies and groups. Why the government had such a hard time defining superhumans in the Marvel Universe I don't really know, but thanks to Tony and Spider-Man's opposition, the SRA is tabled yet again. But not for very long, as we finally enter into the meat and potatoes of the story with Civil War number one in 2006. In this first issue, a team composed of some of the new warriors perform a reality TV show, capturing villains for the cameras. Kind of like cops, but super. In this episode, however, the villain Nitro, hiding out with other supervillains, has enhanced his abilities to an unstable level, and before he can be captured, he delivers a blast that wipes out several of the heroes and all the other villains, but most importantly, the blast results in the obliteration of 612 people of all ages in Stamford, Connecticut. This event, known as the Stamford Incident, plus a previous attack on New York and another rampage from the Hulk, the one that got him sent into space by the Illuminati, convinces the public, the government, and even some heroes that superhumans need to have some form of regulation. This put pressure on the government, and just like that, the SRA is now beginning to be passed into law. S.H.I.E.L.D., under the direction of Maria Hill, since Nick Fury is currently off on the run, is put in charge of enforcing the SRA. Director Hill informs Captain America that he is going to be tasked with hunting down any superheroes who defy registration. But Cap refuses to imprison friends and colleagues because of their biological traits, and he disagrees with the government controlling heroes as it means they decide who the bad guys are. In a bit of a preemptive move, as the SRA isn't law yet, Hill orders her agents to attack. Cap escapes and starts recruiting a secret Avengers team made up of heroes who oppose registration. The secret Avengers operate out of a series of secret safe houses kept secret from everyone within S.H.I.E.L.D. Cap's team continued to apprehend supervillains, usually just leaving them bound up for authorities to find, but also began launching coordinated attacks on prison transports carrying unregistered superhumans to free them. In stark contrast to that, See what I did there? Tony Stark now openly supports the SRA and reveals to the world that he's Iron Man. Um, again. Once the SRA becomes law, Tony leads a new official Avengers team to stop not only supervillains but also apprehend unregistered heroes. Tony also convinces Spider-Man to join the SRA and unmask himself to the public, which he reluctantly does, leading to attacks by supervillains and people in his personal life trying to sue him. In other words, it creates more problems for Peter than he imagined. But Peter's personal problems are not the only issues to surface because of the SRA. One big issue 
issue is that superhumans against registration are being imprisoned in the negative zone in a massive super prison called 42. And all without trial and access to counsel. On top of that, supervillains that were already incarcerated are being released under supervision and used to hunt down unregistered superheroes. Because I guess the SRA makes them not criminals or something? But unsurprisingly, some villains use brutal methods enforcing the SRA. One of these villains, Norman Osborn, even attacks Atlanteans and nearly provokes a full out war between the US and Atlantis. Osborn, however, doesn't seem to be in control of his actions and doesn't know why he did it. But we will circle back to that one. In one of the first major battles, the Secret Avengers were lured into an ambush by the pro registration forces in an attempt by Iron Man to talk the conflict out. However, Captain America attacked, leading to a direct confrontation between the two sides. As the battle began to turn, Iron Man revealed his secret weapon. With Thor currently absent from Earth, Tony authorized the creation of a very aggressive Thor clone enhanced with cyborg components. It's revealed that Tony had secretly collected DNA samples off of Thor after the Avengers were first founded, and kept them for years just in case. The Thor cyborg clone is unleashed on the secret Avengers and goes off the handle slaying Bill Foster Giant Man. This plus the several issues with the SRA dramatically changed the way both sides look at the conflict. Some surrendered and registered while others decided to oppose the act with Captain America. Spider-Man also starts to reconsider his position, especially when he also realizes that the high tech iron spider suit Tony gave him monitors his body and powers and controls him if he steps out of line. So yeah, Spidey joins Cap's side. It's more of the same going forward with coordinated strikes by the secret Avengers and opposition by the government sanctioned Avengers. Eventually during a massive final battle when Steve Rogers got the upper hand, several civilians and emergency workers intervene and tackle Captain America, begging him to stop as these fights have all been endangering the innocent civilians. Steve surrenders on the condition that any of his secret Avengers who now decide to register will be offered amnesty for defying the SRA up to this point. Stark agrees, but of course some heroes still decide to defy the SRA, including Spider-Man. Two weeks later, in the aftermath of Steve's surrender, the 50 state initiative was officially launched and the mighty Avengers assembled as a team under Tony Stark, who was appointed to director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Some heroes chose to move to Canada, because why wouldn't they, while some stay underground, such as the new Avengers. The 50 state initiative basically meant that there would now be an employed superhero team in every single state, while untrained and young superhumans will now also undergo special training at Camp Hammond, set up in Stanford, Connecticut. Just as a side note here though, in 1993, Canada, in the comics, passed a super powered registration act and in 2007, Omega Flight mentions that the law remains in effect and has never resulted in major conflicts between Canadian superheroes. proving that Canadians can handle these kinds of things without having to fight about it, but I digress. In the Civil War tie-in frontline, we get to learn some very interesting information. It's revealed that Tony Stark had the 50 state initiative as his end goal all along. Behind the scenes, he has been manipulating Congress to start talking about the SRA again, pointing out that it could be restructured so it wouldn't weaken the country against foreign attacks. He didn't cause the Stanford incident, but while tragic, it did provide the opportunity to make the SRA SRA law as quickly as possible. He also manipulated the stock market, made Norman Osborn attack those Atlanteans, and did other things all so that the government and he could organize superheroes into a united force spread out across the entire USA that could stand against any attack from foreign powers. Though a couple of reporters discover this, they decide not to go public as it could unravel the good they believe Tony Stark has done. Now a lot of things about the Civil War event are a little confusing, likely due to different writers not properly planning together. For example, at the beginning, Tony Stark seemed to be very much against the SRA. He even hired a villain to manipulate the government into dropping the SRA. But then, he's all for it, and by the end, he was apparently secretly pulling the strings from the shadows. Also, Civil War and the individual comic tie-ins like Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Illuminati, Wolverine, X-Men, X-Factor, and Black Panther that all occurred around the same time have some conflicting ideas surrounding mutants, how the SRA affects heroes outside the US, 
and character motivations. The event led to the passing of Steve Rogers who came back anyways and it also led directly to the Siege event which I personally really liked but it ultimately led to the abolishment of the SRA altogether. This led to an important question for comic books. When you have a huge event that changes a lot of things and has super high stakes, what's the point if things go back to the way they were before it happened? I don't know, what do you think? The event itself did ask important questions and definitely reflected the time it was written. Reality TV for example that plays a big role in the plot of the comic was huge at the time of the event, but not so much now. The way we digest information and news nowadays through the internet and our phones does make it hold up just a little bit more though. There was also a lot going on in American politics at the time with George W. Bush, the Patriot Act, and the early days of America's ongoing wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mark Miller came up with the Civil War event with these events in mind. The ideologies of the lead characters represent this. Iron Man represents government regulation as a sort of liberal rich democrat, while Rogers on the other hand is a libertarian believing that government regulation of superheroes would encroach on their civil liberties. Steve is also incredibly wary of government involvement. The comic is also fundamentally about injustice and how war and conflict affects people and the public. All these issues do in fact stand the test of time, making the Civil War event a historical, relevant and important comic book event named by IGN as one of the greatest comic book events of all time. But what did you think about the Civil War? Who did you side with? Did you like the MCU's interpretation? Leave all of your answers to these questions and your own opinion down in the comment section below. It's been a lot of fun creating this new format of video, so if you enjoyed it, please make sure to hit that like and subscribe button here at Top 10 Nerd. I've been your host, Adam Andrews. You can find my socials in the description below. And until next time, thanks for watching and peace out, my lovely nerds.